Hello everyone, my name is Kevin Johnson and I am the founder of YouBeTheOne.org Incorporated. It is a pleasure to be here with you on today as I discuss National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month, which is very important because just until the last year or so, I did not even know that July was National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. But before I dive in, first I would like to tell you all more about the voice behind this presentation. I have been in higher education going on 20 years now, serving in different roles, different capacities from uh, working in the offices of multicultural affairs and academic support, uh, educator, I taught college success courses, psychology courses, critical thinking and character development courses. I taught GED. I taught classes in the early childhood care and education program, a guidance counselor, uh, and you name it. Pretty much, I have been working in roles where I have been a servant to others. And I am okay with that. I am happy to be of assistance to help people live their very best lives and also to maximize their full potentials in their lives. I am currently a doctoral student at Liberty University. My major is community care and counseling and I have a cognate in psychological trauma. Along with that, I am a certified health and wellness coach, certified life coach, certified mental health first aid instructor. I'm a master uh, trainer for the, the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, also the founder and facilitator for uh, Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, or DBSA Central Georgia, right here in our area in our state. So it's a pleasure to be with you all on today just to share more information about uh, mental health, how the coronavirus and other implications impact what we are seeing and what we are experiencing. Uh, first, I want you to know that this is a multiple part series. This is just part one where I'm going to give you the facts, some of the information about coronavirus, mental health in the African-American community and other communities as well. But like part two, we will kind of dive in and just do a breakdown and study ways in how we can benefit uh, our overall mental health and what we can do as far as dieting, uh, sleep hygiene, uh, monitoring our automatic thoughts, and just looking at how little small things can add up um, to the exacerbation of a mental disorder or the manifest, manifest, manifestation of a mental disorder. Sorry, I got a little tongue tied there for a moment. So just bear with me through this first part. And I promise as we go along, it will get more interesting and you will learn quite a lot. So part one of National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. And let's just dive in and enjoy the presentation. And if you have questions or comments or anything of that nature, know that you can always reach me and I will provide that information at the end of the presentation. So COVID-19 is like, where did this come from? And we have all these misconceptions about the origination of it and from China, from Europe, all over the place. It does not matter where COVID-19 came from, 
All that matters right now is that we take care of ourselves, that we wash our hands, that we wear our masks, that we practice social distancing because the most pervasive disparities in the African-American community, Latino community, and also the American Indian, Alaska Native and Pacific Islander populations where um, research is available for those other areas. But we know for certain that COVID-19 discriminates because it does not like African-Americans and Latinos. Nationally, um, African-American deaths from COVID-19 two times greater uh, than would be expected based on our portion of uh, African-American portions of the overall population in the United States of America. In four states, the rate is three or more times greater. In 42 states, including Washington, D.C., the Hispanics, Latinos make up a greater share of the confirmed cases than their share of the population, just as uh, African-Americans and in eight states is more than four times greater. White deaths from COVID are lower uh, than their share of the population in 37 states and the District of Columbia. So we're looking at COVID-19 and mental health. So we take on the challenges of the different mental health conditions and there's this stigma that's associated with mental illness, especially in African-American communities. But not only that, I, I, I say that quite often because I'm African-American and it is true that it's a major issue in uh, our community because mental illness is stigmatized and there's something wrong with you if you have depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, a personality disorder, anything in that or, or anything on that line. So mental health problems are increased somewhat because the lack of access um, to care. We also have this cultural stigma and a lower quality of care. And oftentimes, um, you know, just based on the African-American culture, it's like what happens in this house stays in this house. We're not going to be out sharing our business with everyone else. So if someone is suffering from depression, anxiety, uh, we're not gonna let anyone know. And besides, if we do have to go and get counseling or seek services, this cultural difference is a big um, hindrance as well because sometimes people want to talk to someone from the same background um, as they, you know, the, as themselves. So they are kind of uncomfortable reaching out or talking to other healthcare providers or mental health providers or counselors who do not look like them. So COVID-19 um, has brought these disparities to light as far as health care in America for African-Americans and Latinos. And we have been seeing that on the news um, week after week now. So mental health conditions, we know it, it does not discriminate, do not discriminate. Um, anyone can experience the challenges of mental illness, regardless of their background. And one thing that I would like to point out is that just because an individual may not uh, experience a mental uh, illness or a mental challenge right now, does not mean that person is exempt from um, developing or uh, the manifestation of a psychological disorder and I don't want to get ahead of myself but in part two we're going to talk about the etiology some of the factors that can bring on the onset of mental illness 
And the last point on this slide is background and identity can make access to mental health treatment much more difficult. When we look at, it goes back somewhat to this, to the cultural competence and wanting to speak with someone who uh, mirrors uh, them. So looking at some of the underlying causes of health disparities, we're looking at the overall mental and physical health, the impact that racism and discrimination uh, have on African-Americans, especially, but more specifically, African-American males. And racism and discrimination is not on, does not only, do not only impact the psychological aspect, but it causes physical ailments in the body as well. It has an impact on African-Americans in ways that um, our counterparts would not understand. They would not grasp uh, the gravity of the impact of racism and discrimination. We also look at the economic and educational um, disadvantages. Um, a lot of our people who are growing up in poverty, they do not get the best education. Education in the homes are not stress. They don't know the importance of going to college or getting good grades and realizing that education can be that vehicle to drive them away from a life of poverty. So we look at health care. We talked about that. We look at individual behavior and also biology. And when we talk about biology, that, that goes back to predisposition. We're looking at genetics and also that family tree. So now let's look at mental health and African-Americans more specifically. 13.4% um, or nearly 46 million people identify as black or African-American. Another 2.7% says uh, multiracial and black and African-American people who live below the poverty level are twice as likely to report serious psychological distress than those living over two times the poverty level. And that makes sense. Um, the chronicity of poverty uh, is another area, area of interest that I have. I have done research on that and actually uh, published an article about the implications of chronic poverty and how it just impacts everything, throws everything out of line um, for African-Americans and other minorities. African-Americans are more likely to feel sadness, hopelessness, and worthlessness than white adults. Why? Why is that so? I will give you all a minute just to ponder, to write down your thoughts on that. And it goes back to um, poverty, living conditions, environment, racism, discrimination. All of, the, all of those have the propensity to impact the feelings of African-Americans and their emotions. In 2018, there was like 58.2% of African-American young adults ages 18 to 25 and 50.1% of adults 26 to 49 had, this, um, was, had a serious mental illness but did not receive treatment. This is unacceptable. And it goes back to that stigmatization of, hey, you must be crazy if you have a mental illness. Are you psycho? What's wrong with you? All those negative connotations prevent African-Americans from wanting to seek help. And the strange thing about it, right, is African-Americans view mental health treatment favorably and those who 
are uh, those with higher levels of education are less likely to seek mental health services than their white counterparts. And African Americans are 20 more, 20% 20 more likely to report having serious psychological distress than whites. I read it out of all order um, just for a reason to, to point out that, okay, 20% are more likely to report having serious psychological distress than whites. But we look at more educated African Americans are less likely to seek help than white people. And why is that? I mean, we're more educated, you know that mental health counseling is effective, um, medication is effective, and other forms of exposure therapies and all of that can help with mental uh, disorders, but African -Amer Americans are still reluctant to go and get help. Why? Why is that so? Because mental health in the black community is not looked upon as something that needs to be shared or that people want to share. So black people encourage others who are depressed, who are sad, who have anxiety to, hey, you just need to pray more. Or this is the worst one of all, snap out of it. You need to repent. What have you done to make God angry that you have this mental or this psychological disorder? Now, when we talk about snap out of it, people do not understand poverty or uh, depression is not the same as sadness. Depression is a mental illness. If they could snap out of it, trust me, they would snap out of it. But the strange thing about it is we do not tell people who um, are suffering with diabetes to snap out of it. You, oh, you just had a heart attack, snap out of it. Oh my goodness, a stroke, snap out of it. But why when it comes to mental illness? Our brain, brains are an organ, so sometimes we have to treat the brain. Why wouldn't we? It controls every other organ in our bodies. So we have to change our perception and how we view mental health, mental illness, psychological disorders, so that we can uh, better ourselves. Praying depression away, we can tell people, okay, just pray, 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 and it, it'll go away, right? So sometimes when people pray, they realize that, hey, it's not helping. I'm not getting any better by praying. Now it can cause other problems where the individual may become upset with God. Uh, God, why won't you heal me? But a lot of times when uh, we ask someone who's battling depression, anxiety, bipolar to pray, a lot of times they are too ill, too depressed to pray. So therefore someone has to stand in the gap for them, pray for them, pray for their healing. It's not that the person does not want to pray to God, to have a closer relationship with God. The person cannot make that connection where he or she is and in that current stage of depression. And the other thing is mental illness is a sign of weakness. You know, lack of faith, laziness, especially, you know, for our black men. Black men, it's almost like, how dare you go to a doctor about depression? You know, we're supposed to be macho men. 
You know, we don't have this mental illness that sl that slows us down. We have to be tough. We have to set that example. And so some of these uh, factors that I just mentioned are some of the reasons people are not reaching out to get help uh, from um, the professionals, your therapists, your clinicians, your psychologists. They're not reaching out because they're afraid. They have heard that, hey, mental illness is a sign of weakness. I can't go that way. I can't go that route. Because if we look back, many people would have thought that slavery, Jim Crow civil rights movement, and all of the trials and tribulations and and unfair treatment that black people had to endure would have killed them. But black people learned to take lemons and make lemonade. They took the scraps from the foods that the master didn't want and they made meals. So over time, black people learned to become resilient. And a lot of times we look at traumatic experiences where someone on the outside looking in would say, hey, that child there is experiencing trauma. But for that child, that's everyday living. And that child is not impacted by that event in a way that someone who has not been exposed all of his or her life in that traumatic situation would never understand, could not grasp that. So depression and anxiety you know, are not seen as treatable medical disorders. Hey, depression is sadness, get over it, snap out of it, you're anxious, pray, just relax, okay? They are all weaknesses. These illnesses are dealt with silently and in shame or ignored altogether. Now, just one thing I would like to point out with depression. Depression is directly the mental health disorder that is directly linked to suicide. And research shows and research tells us that 90% of all suicides, um, the individuals who died had an underlying treatable mental disorder and the more likely than not that treatable mental disorder uh, was depression so here's the biopsychosocial approach right and basically this here looks at all the factors that impact um, the way that um, black people are responding to the coronavirus to mental health and everything. So we look at the physical health, genetic vulnerabilities, and then the psychological aspect, which is very important. Coping skills, your social skills, emotional intelligence, self-esteem. How are you, how are we psychologically prepared for coronavirus or, or, or other stressors in our lives? unemployment, divorce, domestic uh, abuse, uh, child abuse, just bad relationships, and social. We look at the peers, our family circumstances. Look at family relationships, family dynamics. Look at the environment. Is it like safe? Do I feel safe? Are all of my needs met? So, when we look at the biopsychosocial approach and the impact of mental health and coronavirus, it could be any of that, which makes it even more challenging to be able to figure out what needs to be done. How can we help African Americans move forward during this difficult time, during this time of unemployment, stress, sickness, illnesses, and death. So, COVID-19, we back to that again. We talked about the mental health part, and I 
in the beginning introduced the disparities. Talk about mental health in African Americans. Now COVID-19, the impact on health. Okay, African Americans pre-existing health conditions, this is what is making it you know, the virus more uh, deadly for African Americans because of the pre-existing health conditions, hypertension, um, coronary heart disease, uh, diabetes. And we look at not only what goes on in the body, but also other factors and implications of chronic poverty, which is connected to everything we have discussed uh, thus far. The psychological aspects, being able to cope with your loss of job or making less money or uh, drawing unemployment. And what we have to realize also is that for some people who are not working, you know, work is a part of who they are. Even though they may be drawing an unemployment check, but they're not working. So if they're not working, they're not happy. So we have to keep that in mind as well. Also, we're looking at lower academic achievements. Uh, a while back, I did a study and basically it pertained to uh, when I was teaching GED classes. And research shows that people who are less educated, who do not have a high school diploma, they had a higher rate of death than people who had high school diplomas, college degrees, masters, postgraduate degrees, and all of that. And it reminded me of something in the Bible where it said, my people, you know, perish because of the lack of knowledge. And basically, when I thought about it, it's like my people perish because of the lack of knowledge. Even though in the Bible, it was talking about maybe something different. But here in the physical, people are dying because of the lack of knowledge, which um, equals a lack of a high school diploma. Strange, but true. And the other pre-existing health condition is African-Americans, Latinos have higher exposure to stress, to different stressors, daily hassles, and traumatic experiences. Now, we know COVID-19, the ultimate goal is a respiratory disease. It wants to get in the lungs and take over the lungs, right? But not only the lungs now, we look at the gut. It affects the GI tract, kidneys. The kidneys affects the cells lining the, the tubules. The tubules that filter out toxic compounds. And we look at the heart. Patients with severe COVID-19 have a high incident of cardiac arrest. All right. And I heard on the news today and yesterday, as a matter of fact, that uh, some people now, even though they get over COVID, they are left with heart problems uh, or uh, problems with their kidneys. So even after we get over the virus, it still can damage your pancreas, your gallbladder, and other organs way after the virus uh, has left your system. So when we look at the factorial implications, it starts with like a long chain of reactions that can be caused by first unemployment, uh, lack of resources, uh, hunger, illness, death, stress, anxiety, and fear, loneliness, sadness, depression, then suicide attempts, and suicide deaths. So that covers part one. 
um, just looking at coronavirus, the impact that it has on African Americans and the mental health of uh, African Americans and how the health disparities uh, kind of um, exacerbate coronavirus in the African American communities. So here, part two, as it says, stay tuned. With the next section, we will go more into details about um, ways that we can eat better, um, better sleep hygiene, learning to manage self-imposed stress on, and automatic thoughts and what we can do to strengthen our mentality and to become stronger, to become hold, and to deal with these difficult times that we're going through right now. Mental health is serious and we need to take it seriously. We need to seek help when we know something is going on or going wrong in our bodies because it is okay not to be okay. It's the, and that's perfectly fine. And as black people, African-Americans, be proud uh, of who you are uh, as a people because the thing about it is from the very beginning, this society, this nation, this world was not created with minorities of any kind in mind. So applaud yourself to be standing, to be alive, to be strong, to be hold during these difficult and challenging times. You are stronger than you think. You are stronger than you know. You, and you're stronger than you realize. So stay tuned for part two, which will be coming soon. And also I ask that you subscribe to my YouTube channel so that you will know when um, the next presentation will be available. Thank you all so much for your time. I appreciate it so much. And it means a lot to me that you listen. The more we know, the better we can do. Thank you. Until next time. Have a great day.